Hi, it's Jesse. Today on the show, you know him from Twin Peaks, Sex and the City, and my personal favorite, Showgirls. It's Kyle McLaughlin. Oh, dear God. <laughs> I've never been so exhausted after I'm... filming a night, an all night in the water, mm -hmm. trying to keep Elizabeth from drowning, falling off my <clears throat> lap, going backwards and drowning. <laughs> I was like, I don't need to go to the gym for a week. This is Dinners on Me, and I'm your host, Jesse Tyler Ferguson. Kyle McLaughlin is an actor who has really cemented himself as an iconic cult favorite. I mean, look at his body of work. Twin Peaks, Showgirls, Sex and the City, all cult classics. His fan base is a rabid and loyal one. And I think part of that reason is because he commits 100% to every role he plays and then goes that extra 10% to figure out how he can twist his characters a bit off-center. That extra 10%, I call it the McLaughlin touch. Not only does he bring that touch to his film and TV work, but now we're seeing it in his latest foray in podcasting. His new show is called Varnum Town, and it's a narrative true crime story that has some real S-Town energy. Varnum Town is the actual name of the tiny North Carolina town of 300 people, and it's because most of the people there have the last name Varnum. It's just so cool to hear a bit of Agent Dale Cooper and Kyle as he dons his investigative journalist hat and knocks on doors, piecing together a fascinating story that involves cocaine, shrimp boats, and Pablo Escobar. It's very intriguing. Do you want to scooch in over here? Yeah. 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 Thanks for doing this. Oh, it's my pleasure. What yeah. a fun spot. This is my first time here. I brought Kyle to Zinke in West Hollywood. The French-inspired cafe is named for the Zinc's top bars that could be found all over Paris. Oui, oui, monsieur. As someone who enjoys a damn fine cup of coffee, hi, Twin Peaks listeners, I thought a cafe would be the perfect spot for Kyle. Plus, he's such a cultured man between his longtime collaboration with David Lynch, to his wine label, to his latest foray in narrative true crime. Okay, let's get to the conversation. So I'm riding around listening to Farnham Town and I'm seeing like posters for the new Dune. Oh my God. <laughs> and then somehow like Blue Velvet popped up on my yeah. like classics to watch. I was like, why is like Kyle infiltrating my life through like every- We're connected. Every, every turn I'm making. But I was, as I was like looking at like, you know, these billboards for Dune and then also listening to your podcast, I was like, God, I mean, you have had, your career is so eclectic. The yes. scope of your work is really impressive. I just, if you stay around long enough, you know, I yeah. guess <laughs> you get known for a couple of things. Right, um, right, thank right. Thank you very much. I'm. It is. It is fun. Be, today being my birthday too, which is sort of. I know. Happy birthday. Thank you. It. It does give you. Um, it, I take time to sort of look back, a little perspective, yeah. and uh, which I don't do a lot, but, and I'm kind of stunned that I. I started in film work in, at 23 with Dune, yeah. the first Dune. Yeah. And I can't really believe that it, now here I'm 65 and it's 42 years later and I've been doing it for as, as long as I have. I, I feel like I'm pulling the wool over everybody's eyes no, <laughs> for not 40 all. years. And I just have, <laughs> I have, I love it so much and I have such a good time. And I love the, you know, it's the people. It's even oh, even today meeting you, yeah. we're in the same business. I, I don't know you prior to this, but it's really, it's really nice to be able to share something that we both love, you know, love, which is yeah. the, that creative process. So. Well, and you started off doing something that I also love so much, which is, you know, theater. I'm, I'm a yes. theater yeah. boy. Around what age did you start doing uh, that? Teenage years. Yeah. So I was uh, kind of the same age my son is now, like 14, 15, 16, I started. And it was such a great social activity, particularly um, there were a lot of girls running around and I, I was very innocent <laughs> at the time. So this is an easy way to be around them for yeah, a yeah, period yeah, yeah, of time yeah. so you could strike up a conversation and you didn't have to be too shy. So Did you have any early stage kisses? Yeah, I, yeah. I have a tendency to fall in love with my leading lady. That okay. finally, I finally <laughs> yeah, outgrew that. I've noticed that. Yeah, I finally <laughs> outgrew that. That took a while. Um, but yeah, when I was in high school, I had a, uh, actually really one of my my very first strong relationships um, with the actress who was opposite me. What guess. was the show and what were it the was, roles? It uh, was Oklahoma. And funny enough, that was also, you know, I have this wine business. Yeah. Um, and her family was actually where I, <laughs> in high school, not to get anybody in trouble, but we would actually be able, allowed to have a glass of wine with dinner. To appreciate it with a meal, I thought it was a really Absolutely. civilizing, I felt very grown up. Yeah, and, and that was the appeal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Like that started off a string of dating your lady ladies. That's, yeah. 
But then you went to college for So for I went theater. to college for, well, actually, I went to college to try to figure out what I wanted to do, honestly. Yeah. And uh, What were your other options? There weren't a lot. Yeah. <laughs> My dad is a stockbroker, and he, he didn't sort of push me into that idea of business, but he said, you should at least take a business course or two. I took an economics course, and I think I barely passed. Right. But... I always had like one drama course that I took along with yeah. that. So I had an acting course. My first acting course that I took in college was very, it was a weird one. So we were all in a circle, sort of laying on each other's backs, <laughs> listening to each other breathe. And this I said, this so is kind of wacky. I said, I'm not sure if this is me. And there was another girl who said, no, 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 you gotta go take this class over here. Don't do that class. This is the teacher you want. I was like, okay, thanks. So I transferred over. And, and that was more of like what I would imagine. You have a script and you're yeah, working yeah, yeah. on scenes. You were breathing on people's and, yeah, bodies. <laughs> bodies. I was like, I don't know if this is for me. Uh, so I would just take one course and then, and try to muddle through the rest of the way. And, and then it gradually I sort yeah. of... I sort of gave over. I said, you know what? I think this is what I'm supposed to do. So I graduated after three years with a BFA in acting, trained to do repertory theater, pretty much. Did you, know? you do any theater in Seattle or up in the Washington I area? I did. I did, yes. But I left school. I went to work at the Shakespeare Festival in Ashland, so the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, um, the summer of 82, and I played Romeo on the main stage. And then I left from there to go work in Seattle at a theater that sadly is no longer there, the Empty Space Theater. Okay. And we did a, a new adaptation of Tartuffe. Hello. Hello, hello. We're just talking about Tartuffe. Good, you know, as you do. <laughs> as you do. Tartuffe, Tartuffe. Yeah. do you know? Tartuffe? Well, Kyle knows it very know, well. He's... Were you in the play, in the Molière I was play? in the. I was in the play, not in the original French. We were in an adaptation, oh, uh, or wow. adapt, adaptation, I guess, yeah. And That's I played amazing. the Dami, no. yeah, the son. Not everybody knows Tartuffe here, so... Uh, <laughs> might be the only two. We are the only two. <laughs> Have you Tell us about your menu. Have you Zinke before? No, no, no So Zinke, time. Zinke West Hollywood, it's, uh, it's about um, French, Parisian, bistro inspired. So everything is uh, farm to table uh, food. Wow, okay. Um, a bunch of options. Okay. It goes from a tuna tartine. Do you guys know what the tartine is? Yeah. So tartine, yeah. So it's it's an open face uh, sandwich. Um, I'm looking at the tomato avocado one. I think that really appeals to me. What do you, yeah, what no, do you think? Yeah, no, that sounds good. Let's okay. do that. Perfect. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do the asparagus niçoise. Perfect. Wow. They do have this French ham aged Swiss cheese sandwich. The ham and cheese? Oh my God, that looks really good. Why don't you get that? Because that's classic. Look yeah. at the sandwich. Could I have a cup of coffee, please? Sure. I love you? that. I'll join you in the coffee. I'm going to make you say it, too. <laughs> yeah. Damn fine coffee and hot. I'm and sure hot. it's going to be hot. <laughs> yeah, I got it in. Perfect. Okay, we're both having damn good cups of coffee. I love Perfect. Make them hot. Perfect. And I like mine just, Thank you. just black. Thank you. Yay. Um, Thank you very, it. very, very, very much. So it was Tartuffe that this casting director saw you in? No, they, she didn't even see the play. Um, the late Elizabeth Lustig, she was on a tour. Kind of okay. a, a smaller city tour. They were actually out looking for an they unknown. They were up in Seattle looking for They talent. came all the way up to Seattle for an unknown and they found me. And uh, I, I auditioned for her in a, in, a, in a hotel room in a Four Seasons Olympic on video. Um, and she had the video cassette. Yeah. Big tape. And she was so kind. French as well. Okay. The that we're here. Yeah. And she just, and I, I was so curious. I said, how does this work? You know, because I, I know nothing about film. I was, right. I was solely just theater. Just theater, yeah. And she said, well, we take it down and we show and maybe the thing. And I said, and I said, and what do you think my chances are? I was like, you know, and she was like, well, pretty good. She was very honest with me. She yeah. said, I haven't really seen anybody. Now I'm going to San Francisco, so someone could come in. Yeah. I said, okay, well, see what happens, yeah. you know. And that's how it started. Yeah. And it was really meeting David Lynch and, and the connection that we had. Right. And I, I screen tested for him, of course, and everything. But he, I think he kind of had his heart set on me after we met. We shared a common love of the Pacific Northwest. He's from up there as well. We had a lot of things in common. And I think he just felt, well, we felt comfortable with each other, actually. So it makes What's sense. What's the age difference between you two? Is it about 10 yeah, years? Yeah, roughly 10, maybe yeah. a little more, maybe 12, 10 or 12 years. Right, so he's not really like old enough to be a father figure, but no, like, like also brother. not young enough to be a Well, kind of an older brother yeah, that yeah, maybe yeah, yeah, you yeah. didn't know that well when you were growing right. up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was, um, what was your first meeting with him like? I mean, he's such... Obviously, he's such an eccentric person, from what yeah. I understand. Yeah. He's actually not super eccentric and... He's very he's, kind. Uh, yeah. Um, and fun and a good sense of humor. 
And not at all, at least in the meeting, did he seem to be interested in talking about the movie uh -huh. or the role or anything. It was more just... This is for Dune. Yeah. Yeah. W w you know, where are you from? And and uh, I grew up there, and uh, Yak I grew up in Yakima. Was, oh, we talked about, yeah, we talked about Missoula and Yakima, similarly, some of the things we did when we were Wait, kids. Wait, what about Missoula? So I think he's, he grew up, he was oh, born in... I was born in Missoula. No kidding. Yeah, I think Lynch was also born in Missoula. I think I have I think that right. he might be right, because I feel like there's a small list of people that... I know he... Live there, okay. But whether he's born there, I'm not exactly I mean, sure. I only I lived so. there for a year, my first year of my life. But um, <laughs> so, so you, totally have, you have fond memories, they, they, yeah, exactly. Fond memories. But like, uh. yeah, I, uh, I mean, what I've heard is that he's he's a very sort of like kind and down to earth person, and yeah, it's yeah. just you know the, the the art that he creates is so specific yeah. and tonally so um, not. <laughs> it's, it's, it, you can't, it doesn't blend in with any other no, it's, tone. No, it's his own. It's his own thing, you know. Yeah. And uh, I, I read recently that he people consider him the the premier American surrealist filmmaker, mm. and I think that there's a lot of truth to that. I um, think so too. Yeah. I, you know, I'm I'm not a huge film buff, honestly. I don't know as much as I, I probably should know more, but I, um, but I've been fortunate enough to work with I think one of the greats and oh by far just so lucky so great so grateful so lucky not really understanding that when I started just kind of where he stood and and uh, on the scheme of things well and like where so. was he at his career at that point had he done anything huge or was that also sort of he his first he had big thing? done well Eraserhead of course had come right it was very that the, the film he shot when he was at AFI. And then he, I think, I believe Mel Brooks saw that and offered him The Elephant Man. So The Elephant Man became his first kind of break, I guess, yeah. maybe, um, which was a magnificent film. <laughs> yeah. uh, John Hurt, Anthony Hopkins, just a wonderful, compassionate telling of this, of this man who had this amazing, unusual deformity. Then Elephant Man led to Dune, honestly, which it couldn't be a greater departure. Um, a giant lumbering beast of a movie, you know, and and I think we all kind of got lost in it. I had a great time. I, I was, I had no I mean, idea what I was imagine. doing. I can imagine, what, 23? 23. Oh boy. Yeah. So you're being, you're the lead of a huge sci-fi. But no real concept that I'm the lead or the the pressure. I had really? no sense of the pressure. I just like, you know, I'm just going to do do this role, you know. And Because you had nothing to compare it to? Nothing to compare it to. I'd never seen a film. The second film script I ever read was Blue Velvet. And David gave oh that God. to me when I was on, when I was filming Dune. So really no, you know, I had no business being there. I mean, actually. what an introductory <laughs> course to filmmaking. Yeah, it was amazing. Thank you yeah. so much for my coffee. And it, I had just a lovely, lovely group of people. Wait, um, mostly, to, mostly European. I have to have a photo of you drinking a cup of coffee. Oh yeah, here we go, ready, okay. And this is, you Thanks want a up. video, Joanna? Joanna's there happy. There it is, Joanna wants a video of, of okay. yeah, ready? I'm also okay. drinking my cup of coffee. Very good. <laughs> is, it, is it damn good coffee? It's a damn good coffee. Is it, is it hot? It's hot. <laughs> and hot. And hot. <laughs> Okay. Now you have to do the spit take. <laughs> oh, What's well, not with the fish? Oh, no, you did the spit take for no reason. Yeah, because you liked it so much. Because it was hot and I just spit it. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do? I remember something about fishy coffee, too. Mm. Um, yes, Jack Nance's okay. character. There was a fellas don't drink that coffee. There's a fish in the it's percolator. There's a fish in the percolator. Yeah, yeah. And we're all just like, just, just <laughs> put it in our mouth. Like, so there was that moment that a lot of comedy. <laughs> yes. Um, so, but Dune itself did not do. Well, no, no, of, no. Sadly, um, the movie, you know, it's just so massive. Right. Very difficult to sort of tell uh, an arc that makes sense in the hour. And we, we were two hours, 16 minutes, which is long at that time for a film. Not now. Um, not now. Jesus. <laughs> you can't. Don't bring it in under three and a half. <laughs> oh there you go. Gosh. You, know. you have to, like, phone a friend to tell them you're okay before going to see... Killers of the Flower Moon. Just so yeah, you know, yeah. I'm not going to be available for seven no, days. No, I'm gone. I'm gone. Turn your phone off. Make sure you go to the bathroom before yeah. you sit in your seat. <laughs> they didn't want to interrupt. You don't want to interrupt the movie by getting up out of your seat. And then you're going to miss stuff. Right. And then you come back and say, so what did I miss? So what did I miss? And everyone's so talking. So many things. And it's annoying, you know. <laughs> and then that led, you know, great, grat great gratitude that David came back and said, We'd, I'd like you to do Blue Velvet, um, which we were supposed to start right after Dune finished. That got postponed as well. So David was also struggling a little bit. Right. Because um, we both were suffering kind of from the response of Dune. But we started filming Blue Velvet in August of that year um, of 80. So that would have been 85. But, you know, initially that wasn't that well received until 
Pauline Kael wrote a really wonderful review about it, kind of educating people about it and critics in particular. And I think gradually it sort of gained it now, of course, it's a very revered well, It's one of film. the, I feel like, top movies of all time. I yeah. mean, when people talk about great so, filmmaking, So weird to go from that. Dune to Blue Velvet, right? That's that. I mean, totally, yeah. It's like, <laughs> wow. Crazy. It is a wild ride. It's a wild ride. And I had sort of been prepared. I mean, people told me that it's very erotic. Right, um, yeah. But I just kept thinking, you know, here you are at this point, what, 26 or something? Yeah, 25 20, 26. or 26, yeah. yeah. I mean... I think back to like how, what I was doing at that age, and it right. certainly wasn't like doing nude scenes with Isabella <laughs> really Rossellini, Rossellini, like, you know? One can only dream. And your, <laughs> your first butt scene of many to yes, come. Yes, yes, I've had a lot of butt scenes. Yeah, you have. I've stopped that. You know, I realized <laughs> that I'm at a certain age now where that's just no longer going to work. Well, just no one's asking. We should <laughs> let people know that you're still available for the still butt scenes available. if they want them. You know, it's, it depends on kind of what... What you need. Listen, um, if don't, it's a very don't dark put yourself room. in a box, Kyle. Really? Thank you very much, Jesse. I appreciate that. You're absolutely right. <laughs> and was Laura Dern one of your first? Um... <laughs> he was, yeah. So that was my, yeah, my first movie um, girl, movie crush. girl, friend. Yeah, we were together for four years after I know, that. I know, I know. A long time. You're a cute couple. We were a true couple, and we have the pictures to prove it. I, we love it. I, I saw kids. a recent photo of the two of you, and it, I always love seeing when people come back together and... You know, it, she was. She, she's been very kind. She's been very understanding. I did not end that very well, and she. Well, how, I mean, I, well, let's it, let yourself you off know, the hook a little bit. It, you were yeah. how old? Of twenty? Uh, I was. We were both kids, and yeah. it, but but you know, I. Uh, it was anyway. I felt, felt felt bad about it, but anyway, we 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 have gotten back together. We're great friends now, and uh, and I just adore her. She's got the best sense of humor. Yeah, it, I've you met know. her a few times and I really, really like her yeah. so much. She is smart, uh, beautiful, empathic. Like, she's almost like, kind of like, scarily tuned into things. Uh -huh. And just, but also has this kind of, little bit of a body side to her of humor, which I think she gets from her mom and her dad, certainly. Yeah. Um, so she's a wonderful mix of qualities that I just think are spectacular. Yeah. I love her. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you guys had great chemistry, too. Yeah, it's... we worked together well. And then we got to come together for Twin Peaks The Return, which was... That's right. That's when right. when David told me that he was casting her as Diane in that, I was like, that is the most brilliant thing you could have ever said to me. Yeah. And I was so excited to I get to work with her. I know you always want to see who Diane is during that. Right? Because you're talking to her on this tape recorder. Right. Sending her messages. And I never like, had an image. I didn't really have an image of anybody. I was just, I just figured so I was talking great. to someone. I didn't have a specific thing. Yeah. Um, shame on me as an actor. No specificity. Uh, <laughs> but I figured the audience would make it up in their range, yeah, you know? Yeah. It's one of the beauties you of gotta movies, leave, you right? got to give the audience some responsibility. Absolutely. Right? they got to do some, their job. That's the point. you got to do everything for, for God's them. sake. So true. Did it feel like at that point in your career, which you could now call it yeah, a career, you were making money yeah, doing it. Yeah. Um, did it feel like... You were in a place where you were kind of in charge of like what you could do tonally, or did you still sort of feel like you were just taking the opportunities as they came? Making, yeah, definitely the latter. Because what yeah. I'm really impressed with in your career, specifically in the, the first part of your career, is you were doing this thing really well, and it was sort of in that partnership with with Lynch yeah. that you sort of carved this niche out for yourself, where you yeah. played these really obscure characters that kind of had these like secrets, and yeah. there was undercurrent to all, and maybe that's just because you're a great actor and like you, you add, that's what you've added to it. I don't think I have it, many but... undercurrents at all, but it, thank you. <laughs> I, uh, uh, thank you very much. I, you know, what happens is when you, especially at that age, the one thing that you can do or that you do well that you're sort of known for is the thing that you just don't, you don't want to, you don't want to do anymore. You know, you're right. like, I want to be that guy. You right. know what I mean? So there was a lot of that in, in, in kind of my, in the angst of that age is like, ah, oh, you know, I sort of want to do the, do the role, the Tom Cruise role in this, or do, you know, whatever yeah, this guy Yeah, who were your contemporaries here. at that time that you were sort of, like, whose careers you were looking up so to? So the Brat Pack was going crazy, so it was all of those guys yeah. who were working. Rob Lowe, of course, was, was out, and uh, Judd Nelson, I remember. Oh, yeah. Um, I remember when Dune came out, Willem Dafoe. So these were all the people that were out, kind of, working at that time. Um, yeah. Emilio Estevez, all of that crew. Yeah. Uh, and Tom was there, Tom Cruise was there, of course, as well. Um, Timothy Hutton. I mean, all these are like huge. Yeah, they're, they're, at that time in the '80s, you know, the mid to late '80s, even early '90s, it was a big deal. Yeah, I never really worked with any of them, but they were around. We did um, 
Well, when I did the doors, you know, I worked with Val, and Val, right, Val of course, Palmer. was yeah, who I admire so much. Uh, and that was with uh, Oliver Stone, right? Oliver Stone, yeah, yeah. yeah wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait. Back up. Uh, yeah. Did you, am I right in saying that you turned down Oliver Stone initially for Platoon? Well, I I did. You did. Kind of. Yeah, I did. I kind of. I, it, but he wasn't the Oliver Stone of today. And okay. the script, I liked the script, but I was a little c- kind of concerned about the end part of the movie and what Chris does and the cold blood killing. And the, I was like, ah, I don't know. This is the role that Charlie Sheen ended up doing. Charlie Sheen ended up right. doing, yeah. And, of okay. course, the movie blew up and was an amazing right. thing. And, and off, you know, hats off to Charlie. He did a great job, and off he went on his journey. Um, but then the doors came around, and Oliver said, "No, I want you for a men's Eric." And I was so he like, wasn't upset that you I had. I don't think so. I think he was kind of. Um, oh, these are the. T- this is a tartine, right? Wait, so we this just... is a tomato avocado tartine. Okay, great. With Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you. I don't you. think there's enough avocado on there. I don't think there's enough more? avocado. We get some more? <laughs> there's like seven avocados gave their lives. Thank God, to this right? Sandwich. This, but it looks, in it looks delicious. insanely good and fresh. But I, you know, I, I was just thinking about it because you know here you are turning down Oliver Stone, well, and yet he still gave you opportunity. Well, to be to be completely candid, that year, um, I think it was the Independent Spirit Awards. He, mm-hmm. Oliver was nominated, of course, for Platoon, mm-hmm. and it, Laura Dern and I are standing on the podium, and we are presenting that award, and we oh. open the thing, and it's. Oliver Stone. Oh my god. And gosh. he wins. And I'm like, I'm like, well, this is gonna be interesting. Oh yeah. So we're standing, he's coming up, walking up, and he leaned into me just before he made his acceptance speech, and he says, and you turned it down. Oh yes! <laughs> That's so he good. He whispers that in my <laughs> ear, and I step back and I'm like, well, I can't argue with that. <laughs> no, yeah, you're absolutely right. I so did. would you have turned down Oliver Stone today? No, no, no. I don't think so. No, no, not after having the experience of working with him on the doors, because he's brilliant. And he's complicated, very complicated, obviously. Um, but he he makes films that you want to be involved with, and thank God I had the chance yeah. as Ray. And he gave me the opportunity to be a pretend rock star. Yeah. I mean, what could be if better? you ever have an occasion to be a pretend rock star, I'd right. say take it. It's interesting that you mentioned those, because those are movies that I've never met an actor who has probably more what I would consider cult classics under their belt than you do. <laughs> I don't know how you look at it, but it's quite remarkable. I mean... No. A lot of people that knew I was sitting down with you were really, I mean, I was obviously very excited myself, but people were like, are you, do you understand, like, the importance of this man? I was like, yes, I get it. No, 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 no. I can't hear that. That's no, awful. no, you have to hear it. Well, Your ego must be fed. You. It's must be um, fed. More, give me more. more. <laughs> but so then, so talk about um, Twin Peaks a little bit and sort yeah. of what that moment in your career was like this obviously was a huge it was a, a it was kind of a weird little twist you know if there is a if there's a graph or a chart or a trajectory or what have you you know it started off going very high and then it dropped very very low i was saved in a way because it was david lynch going into television so right. he's a filmmaker bringing his sensibility to network television okay so right okay we can share these Yes. Uh, there goes. Oh, perfect. Oh, okay, we got Kevin you. Cheese sandwich. You can take that. Thank you. Let me take this. And then the salad. That's beautiful. Do you want any more coffee? How do you feel? You want a I'll bit? have or? some more coffee. I would love some too. Right some Bless your heart. Thank you. Thank you. It's very good. Ooh, this looks great. That looks good. That's a meal. I guess David Lynch at that point had established himself as a certain uh, expert of a certain tone. Mm-hmm. So you knew what you're getting yourself into when you worked for him. Was kind there? Of, yeah. I've been a part of projects where it's like you really have to trust that what you're doing is being looked after and is being taken care of. You know. And like, for example, Cocaine Bear with Liz Banks and um, oh my God. Margot Martindale, we'd make fun of her catchphrase as Margot Martindale, right. not as her character, but her catchphrase as Margot was like, I'm just concerned about the tone. <laughs> And Liz kept saying, I got it, I got a handle on it, Mario, yeah. don't have to, you have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about the tone. Yeah. I got it, I got it. It's the- Elizabeth Banks. I'm, I'm kind of like, I would have no problem with the tone. I'm like, yeah, let's yeah, go, girl, yeah, yeah, let's yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, I, And I've known her for 20 years. I, but I there's a control her, thing. But there is this thing. It's like, I yeah. don't know, maybe like, who knows? No, it's like if you, depending on how many times you've been burned or the experiences, right. you can, the controlling factor, and then also, you know, you can feel like I'm, Exactly, I am not being looked after, which is also a terrible feeling. Well, that kind of brings me to Showgirls a little bit, if you don't mind. <laughs> that um, was a nice, very nice segue. Very. <laughs> but well I mean, done. that was a yeah. film that, and I've. Let me just tell you right now, 
I, I am a massive, You're a huge fan. massive fan. And listen, Kyle, you know, I I've trusted things... your taste up until this point. <laughs> <laughs> I have things that I have not enjoyed that I've done. Yeah. And I beg people not to watch them. Yeah. You're what, what I consider. I know that you initially did not. I think you've come to love Showgirls now, as as, <laughs> as, as uh, you've, you've uh, caught up with everyone I've else. Accepted it. I've accepted you've it. You've accepted it that yeah. it's a genius piece of movie making because it is. <laughs> um, but there Your is words, the, the not mine. what you've done that you had, this thing that you did that you did not feel was great. Right. Right. Brings so many people so much joy. Well, has got to be a wonderful thing. I wish yeah. the stuff that I considered not good brought people even a fraction of the joy that Showgirls brings people. You make a good point. Because it, at the end of the day, we're in the, we're in the business of entertainment, right? And let's say Showgirls, without a doubt, is entertaining. Not for the original reasons we were right. doing it, um, which I think is why it's so successful. Because yeah. everyone, if you're going to do high camp... You can't wink at it. You cannot wink. And nobody was winking. Nope. Nobody was winking. We were in for a penny and for a pound. It was all, you know... So, um, it's it's very cringy for me to watch Sugar. That's so I can't. I, I haven't been yeah. able to. I was going to ask you if, you'd re, if you've revisited it recently and in um, what capacity and what was that like? I have seen amongst two. Somebody sent me a couple of scenes. Um, we're actually working together on a book project, and he Can sent I ask me a couple of scenes. scenes. Um, Did which it one? He sent me water. No, no, okay. not that one. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that one vividly. Oh dear God. <laughs> I've never been so exhausted after um, filming a night, an all night in the water, mm -hmm. trying to keep Elizabeth from drowning, falling off my <clears throat> lap, going backwards and drowning. <laughs> I was like, I don't need to go to the gym for a week. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I was like, this is incredible. <laughs> and also in water, you know, the pool was heated. Very, yeah. Everything was great. Yeah. But even, you know, six hours in water, seven hours in water, eight hours... You get cold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what, how yeah. warm it is. You just yeah, yeah. you start to like lose lose your sanity. Right. Um, so, anyway, it was so it was a crazy night. It was a crazy night. Yeah, I lost, lost my sanity. sanity. <laughs> it was one of the last days of filming, if not the last day of filming. I think that scene for me. They may, right. they may have done other stuff, but that was what a way last. to end the set. That's a I wrap mean, on Kyle. That's a. <laughs> <laughs> now we know all about him. <laughs> so everything is there's no more mystery. Um, anyway. but so they sent you some scenes. You know what it was? Actually, it wasn't scenes. It was. Um, like a long teaser reel. Okay. So it had piece. Oh, that's oh, cool. that's some coffee. Very nice. Jeez. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so it was. A, it was a, like a, yeah. So like a sequence of like the lap dance that I get, um, and and there was another scene with me, and Gina, who I love, Gina Gershon. She's a friend. Um, but I had the best time filming that. Jesse. I'm glad. I was. I was. We were working, in South Lake Tahoe. Um, at a, a proper theater. We had to get out by a certain time because Carrot Top was coming in. Stop it. I'm not, I'm absolutely serious. Carrot Top was going to perform, so we had to be in, done and dusted by a certain date. And listen, it's, it, it's not a terrible thing to be in scenes with people who have to be, particularly women, who have to be <laughs> not completely dressed. I'm, not, I'm just saying it was okay. It was okay. I didn't mind you it. You suffered for your art. I suffered for my art. And then during the days when I was not working, there was the best snowfall they'd had forever. And I right. stuck my skis and everything in my trailer. So I would sneak out with my car, load my skis in, and I would go skiing. So I was like, I'm having a great time. Yeah. And when I watched the filming and the, and the show, because this is what they presented, I said, this is a regular Vegas show. This is going to be fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and then I saw the movie. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I was like... What happened? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Oh my God! It was not. La I was not laughing at the time. It was a lot of sweat, desperation. Right. What am I going to do? Sure. Did you do you feel like it impacted your career in a negative way? Yeah. yeah. In what way? Do you? I think it was just there was no. Um, I think we probably swept the Razzies that year. Right. Um, but there was like no. It was there was kind of the thing where like I mean you took a hit but not. Right. You weren't gonna be, you know, done and dusted. You're, right. you're, you've still got, you know, a few right. other opportunities. Right. But it was definitely um, a blow. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. On that graph. Sure, sure, <laughs> it sure. It was a plummeting uh, for a while. But then, I mean, again, like to have such, you know, 
it's such a <laughs> beloved movie. I really do feel like it's a beloved movie. I mean, I don't know a single one of my friends who doesn't love that movie. No, it's good. I'm worried and about I your feel friends. I like we like it for all the right reasons, too. I don't think it's for the wrong reasons. I think it's really, really entertaining. But it is interesting because it did ask you to tr- trust a tone, which you all seem yeah. to trust. Yeah. We weren't really protected, I got to say. Yeah. And I love Paul yeah. Verhoeven. I think he's a brilliant director. Yes. Um, so I signed up because I loved Soldier of Orange. I loved Spetters. Mm-hmm. I loved Robocop, uh, Robocop yeah. Basic Instinct, all of these. I'm like, this guy, love basic instinct. I was like, this is going to be amazing. Yeah. His vision is going to be amazing. Yeah. And I don't know what happened, but between that and Joe Esterhouse, who was a screenwriter who was, mm-hmm. you know, that was, he was hot at the time, I said, the ingredients are there, I said, mm-hmm. you know. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to take a gamble. Um, I, you know, I mentioned earlier in the interview, I knew I could do this one thing, but I want to kind of do the dark, you know, right. the, the villain of the piece, if you will. And this was an opportunity to do that in a, in a right. good size film, the expectation was. And, um, and it just was <laughs> just, you know, a fiery plane crash of disaster. I know you like it, and I'm happy that you do. I right do, now. I love it. I, I don't know, want you to talk poorly of my baby. No one can see that. He's, Jesse is very serious. He's almost crying. I am almost That's crying. But no, but I, it actually <laughs> fills me with so much joy that it was a good experience for you to do. But the experience was great, yeah. And that makes me very happy. Yeah. Um, and I enjoyed working with Paul. He's crazy, I, but I really enjoyed working with yeah. him. So. Yeah. Has there been anything in your career that has surprised you, has been like a happy thing that's not been what you expected it to be? And been the, a gift. The Flintstones was kind of a really? surprise. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I auditioned for that. Was the Flintstones audition, was that an opportunity for you to, I know you played a villain in that. Uh, it was, was just an opportunity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Was like, I'm not working, so I gotta do something. Right. And they said, well, what about the Flintstones? And I said, I love the Flintstones. Yeah. And they said, well, we got a new audition. And I was like, okay. And I remember just going in and just kind of, I was actually pretty loose. Mm. And and I really liked the people that I was meeting. Brian Levant directed it, Bill, um, Bruce Cohen. Producer, Bruce Cohen, I, I love, love Bruce. Love Bruce. And that was the beginning of our friendship. Ah, oh, he's such a great guy. He's a great guy. Great guy. Um, and I got the role. I was like, oh, holy smokes. Um, it was such a fun thing to do. The most comfortable costumes I've ever worn. <laughs> you know, a little Diane Van first, you know, one one button number here, yeah. suede. That was pretty comfy. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth Taylor was... Yeah. I mean, the cast was crazy. What an experience. Bruce got Elizabeth Taylor to do that movie. It was amazing. I think it was, um, she had to have a gift every day. Wait, 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 stop. She, she, she had, had to have a gift? A gift every day. <laughs> and she had to have, and in the, in the dressing room trailer, so everything was green. She had to have green greenery around her. If you, if you oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah, right? I would take that. And I said, I'm, those are going right into my contract right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, my, yeah. my writer, that's going to be that's a absolutely. gift every day. <laughs> I love the gift every day. Was no, it something right? like? Okay, give me an example. Of what jewelry? Is, jewelry? Yeah. Like nice jewelry? Yeah. This is this is secondhand now. Wow. And Bruce, Bruce probably told me and said, "Don't ever tell anybody this." Oh. I'm like, "Too late." <laughs> Let me know if we need to cut it. It's I don't too think, late. I don't no, think I think we'll be okay. I think we're okay. Oh my god, that's really fantastic. Mm. To continue the theme of you sort of becoming part of these cultural moments and these cult mm. classics. Yeah. I mean, I I consider Sex in the City to be in that. And I, I, you know, that's another show that I feel when it was happening, it was so buzzy and so zeitgeisty. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about like what that whole, well, first of all, how did you get that The part? zeitgeist, I yeah. was clueless. Right. So I was like HBO, Sex and the City. I was like, what is that? I really was living under a rock. Um, <laughs> yeah, you really were. But I, but I was like, but this, they said this thing, they, they're interested in me for this role. I don't know, and I was I was with my wife. We weren't married yet, but I was with Desiree, and I said, what do you think? I said, I'm not so sure. I don't know. And she said, you're doing it. And I was like, okay. Right. <laughs> like, and thank God I listened. Um, and, I, you know, she sort of said, "This is listen, this is, the, this is a really hot show, HBO. It's a big deal. Um, it's, and this is, you know, this is her. She understands. Yes. Yeah. I do not. Um, anyway, so I met with Michael Patrick King and Jenny Bix, mm-hmm. uh, writers on the show. And... When I went to the meeting, it was, I had been sort of, he's, you know, Charlotte's husband, Upper East Side, cardiac doctor, heart doctor, surgeon, you know, and I was like, wow, this is, this is my chance. Yeah. This is my chance to be 
kind of a stud. Wait, let me you pause know? you for a moment. Did you watch any of the show no. before you had this? Okay. I had not watched Continue. any of the shows. <laughs> Very good question. Very good question. So I go to the meeting. And we sit down and we're talking and, and I love them both. They're very, they're yeah. great, very smart and Absolutely. great. And I said, oh, this is going to be great. This is going to be great. And I'm sort of saying, you know, I'm talking about this. I, I was like, you know, I kind of, I sort of see this guy. He's Upper East Side. He's, you know, he's pretty masculine, sort of a John John Kennedy type of energy, you know, um, and a powerful guy. And they were like, they were nodding, you know, and saying, yeah. And then said, and they were, and I said, there's a couple other things we need to explain to you, sort of, um, you're, you're going to be impotent. And I said, and I said, Okay, and then and they said, and you have a very close relationship with your mother. Right. And I was like, and I was like, crushed. I was like, okay, <laughs> okay. But there's a side of you that goes, okay, I can, I can do that, but I can still, yeah, yeah, be the stud guy, right? Can I please? Can I please? Right. And um, anyway, it, it, it was, it was a great experience. I really enjoyed working with Kristen. She's, she's one of those people that is sort of, I think she's inadvertently funny. Yeah. I never knew if she knew she was funny or, or not. She just was yeah. herself. Yeah. And she's hilarious. And Frances Sternhagen. Oh, I mean. God. Just the moments. You know, there's some great moments in there that were the writing. Yeah. You know, the shopping for the bed moment where we're all three laying on yeah. the bed. You know, the bathtub scene, which is yes. an iconic, iconic scene with her smoking on the toilet. Not in Charlotte's reaction. You know, yes. like, this is all so very wrong. Yeah. And we're like, what? Um, and it continued with the trend of, like, keeping you naked. It did. <laughs> it did. Yes. To the point I mean, where there was, one on scene, show, yeah. there was one scene where I think Michael was, because uh, I was sort of like, I can't, he, every week. You know, it's, it's part of doing um, particularly that kind of a show, mm -hmm. weekly episode. You don't have the script. I don't know what the next script is going to be. Right. You get it, like, the week before. So, yeah, yeah it, there's a lot of excitement and there's a lot of fear because it's like suddenly they could say, oh, in this scene, you're coming out of the shower. Mm -hmm. And you have a huge erection, and then you have to do this and this. And I'm like, and I'm like, okay, we got. There's a couple things we have to talk about right yeah, here. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, this is not going to work for me. <laughs> um, so anyway, so it was a little bit of like, okay, guys, uh, right. you're, 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 you're going a little, little, bit. little bit. Pull it yeah. back. Pull it back. I mean, I know Sex and City's having a big <laughs> reboot resurgence right now, but yeah. it's also you know, a few years ago, Twin Peaks had the sort of same. Reboot. Uh, we did, yeah. What did it feel like to come back to a role that was sort of so iconic in the early stages of your career and to not only get to come back to it, but then also to have it received so warmly again? I mean, the reboot was really well was received and love. you were nominated yeah. for yeah. awards. And um, it's. It was a, kind of a love, love letter. I remember going to work every day early in the morning, you know, when you can be sort of grumpy. And I got up and I said, I am so grateful. I'm so happy to go to work. I get to work with one of my very dear friends, David Lynch, a brilliant creative genius. I'm doing a character that I really love. This is living, I'm living the dream right now. Truly. And that was, that was my experience. And one of the great joys was also watching David revisit a place that had been difficult the first time around. Uh -huh. um, you know, as the series had gone on, there, there was a lot of tension and, and drama, turmoil. And to see him come back to a place that I, kn I knew he loved. He loves the world of Twin Peaks so much. Uh -huh. And to have the creative freedom, thank you Showtime, thank you David Evans, to like really create his, his vision was such a gift. Yeah. Such a gift. And that, will, that show will be around for a long, oh, long forever. time. Oh, yeah, forever. Yeah, so, absolutely. Great, um, thank you. I, I love that you like lived in that bizarre world for you know the beginning of your career and mm -hmm. came back to it at the end. And now like with Barnum Town, it's like you found this other community yes. that is almost equally as wacky and as obscure as as Twin Peaks. Yeah, and it is. It was. We discovered that as we went into this. Yeah, I mean, so journey. first of all, tell me how you ex discovered the story of Barnum Town because I've. Googled it and I can't find yeah. now there's a little bit more information because yeah. of the podcast. So Varnum Town it's a, Varnum Town is a community in, in coastal North Carolina, a uh, small fishing community. And it, I hardly call it a town because it's really roughly 300 people kind of loosely scattered around. And there is a downtown dock and kind of wharf area that would, I guess, function as the center. But really, really off the beaten track on little inland waterways. And this sleepy little community in, 19, in the 80s and early 90s was a, a, a huge hub 
for importing, shipping, smuggling, cocaine, marijuana, quaaludes, all coming up from South America from ostensibly Pablo Escobar's cartel. They had shifted their sites off of Miami because it was, the you know, it became very hot there. Yeah. I heard of this story from someone who moved there. And I said, this is very interesting, very unusual. So I sat on it for a couple of years and then it came back around again because the woman herself was writing a book. And I said, you know, there might be something here to, to do and podcasts might be the way to approach it. Right. But I said, but this is not a world that I understand. So I said, let's reach out to somebody who knows what they're doing. And Josh Davis, investigative reporter, done a number of these kind of things, said, let's get together a small crew. Let's reach out to Lynn, Lynn Betts, who is writing the book and see if she can help sort of as a liaison connect us with some of these people that were involved and then let's tell the story. Yeah. And I said, that sounds like a great idea. So that's what we did. And What's we came, it like we came away with a crazy story. I know you came away with a really crazy story. I cannot wait for more episodes to go. Uh, to be on the ground in this town. I mean, there's this great moment in the podcast where you knock on the DEA's, um, was it yeah. the DEA? Right? Yeah, the DEA, Mike Grimes, yeah. And he does not, he's not happy that you're there. Yeah, no. And he comes after you a little bit. Yeah. I, I personally would have been terrified. <laughs> Yeah, well, just, I, I don't let someone people. To I had Josh with me. me. I just put yeah. Josh in. I said, yeah, "You yeah. lead." I said, and then they, it, it, but he saw me and he said, eh, "I recognize you." Yeah. And then this kind of softened it a little bit, yeah. and then he was more more accommodating. Um, but he he also intentionally lives uh, off, off the, the grid, grid, you know, out in the boonies, and he loves to fish. And people have been there for generations, families for generations, not moving, not leaving, right. staying in this community, you know. Um, that was interesting as well, because a lot happened. You know, there were a lot of people went down, there were a lot of indictments. When it finally everything collapsed, most of the town suffered to some degree. Right. And yet, there was no major retaliation, or no murders, nothing, it just happened. And they got on with their lives because they don't have anybody else. Mm -hmm. That's it. And I think, I said, I think I understand, because the question is, why didn't, you know, in our world, in yeah. TV movie, it's like, oh, retribution, you know, we're yeah. gonna kill that guy, we're gonna do this. But, in reality, that didn't happen. Right. And, and I thought that was a really interesting comment, um, that people just found common ground, didn't, disagreement, you know what I mean? But they were able to live together still. Right. And that was interesting. Because basically this whole town well, they were all decided involved. to team up with Escobar and, mm -hmm. and, and allow him to use their town their port, to... Yeah, and their shrimp boats that were not be, being used because it, it was, uh, uh, shrimping was in a depression. Um, and they're the perfect... Honestly, the perfect vehicle for Thank moving you. contraband from a right. mothership that's out on the ocean, you know, right. anchored off 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 right. shore, bringing it from there into into town and offloading it and putting it on semi trucks right. and dispersing it from there. It's shocking to me that the story hasn't been told. I'm so happy you found it. Thank it's, you. It's a really fascinating yeah, it's moment in history. Yeah. Through all that, through this podcast, you've sort of. I think discovered a new um, pocket of entertainment with your TikToks and your social media. <laughs> I didn't know you to be much of a social media person I, before this. I was kind of, but I enjoyed I enjoyed the media, the creative side of it really yeah, 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 appeals yeah. to me. Short form, very short, yeah, very form. short. I like love six that. seconds. Uh, exactly. Um, and I thought, well, you can say a lot in that if you can. But I'm also it's it's not all me. Listen, I'm working with um, some of my wife's. Uh, team actually. Uh, what's your wife super do? Super creative. She has a company called Full Picture. She's basically she's going to run the world. I think. Yeah. And so she's really really <laughs> smart. Um, because and it, the the concepts of your TikTok specifically are really genius. There and this is some of the people I'm working. They're smart. They're young and they're tapped in. Um, and I have to ask my son occasionally. I said. Am I making things? Is is you know? Am are I you worried? Yeah. Right? Is, it, is it cringy? <laughs> are you getting? Is it cringy? And he and I said, I said, I, am I ruining your riz yeah. at school? <laughs> no. And, what does that and mean? And he's like, no, dad. He's like, what it's is okay. ruining well, your you riz? You have to mean? learn these terms now. What does that mean? mean? Well, it's cr short for it's sort of a slang for charisma. You know, what's how's your riz? Ruining your riz. Yeah. How's your, your riz? riz? How's your riz? Is it all right? He's what's pretty good. He's Callum. 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 We're not here to ruin your riz. No. No. No, enhancing, enhancing. I'm so happy you did this. I'm so glad that you invited me, Dee. This is great. Yes. This is a pleasure. Next week on Dinners on Me, you know her from her iconic run on Saturday Night Live. It's Rachel Dratch. We'll get into her latest foray into the supernatural, what it was like to become a surprise mom in her mid-40s, and how her 50th birthday inspired the Netflix comedy Wine Country. 
Dinner's On Me is a production of Sony Music Entertainment and a kid named Beckett Productions. It's hosted by me, Jesse Tyler Ferguson. It's executive produced by me and Jonathan Hirsch. Our showrunner is Joanna Clay. Our associate producer is Angela Vang. Sam Baer engineered this episode. Hans Dale Shee composed our theme music. Our head of production is Sammy Allison. Special thanks to Tamika Balance Kolasny and Justin Makita. I'm Jesse Tyler Ferguson. Join me next week.